Yeah. Uh, so hello everyone. Um, welcome to Ask Seminar Series. Um, I'm John, Seminar um, Coordinator. And um, for this seminar, we'll have um, Professor Walker with us. Um, and um, um, just so you know, then this seminar is being recorded and we will publish the recording on our YouTube channel. Oh. And this is our last seminar this semester. So I'd like to thank everyone for uh, constantly showing up and for supporting our seminars. Um, and before uh, the speaker gets started, um, I will head this over to our uh, director, Anna Williams, and she will be introducing the speaker. Anna. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Jeffrey Walker, who is from the Department of Civil Engineering at Monash University, where he leads research on soil moisture observations, including the only Australian airborne capability for simulating new satellites. He works on soil moisture satellite missions at NASA, ESA, and JAXA as a science team member for the Soil Moisture Active Passive Map Mission, SMAP, and the CalVal team member for the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity, SMOS, and Global Change Observation Mission Water. Dr. Walker did his graduate and undergraduate and graduate work at the University of Newcastle in Australia and worked for some time at Goddard Space Flight Center to implement his soil moisture work globally before returning to work in Australia. He's back in this side of the world for an extended sabbatical visit, and we're very pleased to have him here today to tell us about next generation soil moisture mapping technology. Dr. Walker. Thank you for that introduction. It is my pleasure to be uh, back here again amongst uh, some familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, so today I am going to talk a little bit about uh, towards the next generation soil moisture mapping uh, technology with a particular focus on um, or emphasis around agricultural production. So the demographers tell us that by 2050, the world's population is going to reach around nine billion people, and that's going to require us to produce 60% more food than we are producing now. And we've got to do that with no additional land, or in fact, potentially less land as our prime agricultural land continues to get eaten up by our cities. Um, and with no additional water, or perhaps even less water um, in the face of water reforms, and also um, climate change with that water being perhaps delivered in more intense periods rather than more distributed across the growing season. And so that is uh, quite a challenge. And so that means that we need to be able to be more efficient with how we use the available water that we have for irrigation purposes, rather than the perhaps more traditional techniques of applying when the farmer thinks it's appropriate to do so. And so by being more efficient, hopefully that means we can irrigate longer into the into the irrigation season and potentially irrigate more land than we are uh, today. Obviously, you know, this addresses a, a number of um, the sustainable development goals, as you can see listed up the top there. And so let's first of all look at what are the soil moisture requirements for um, agriculture production in particular. So I've got on this little chart here, um, a plot of the, the temporal resolution requirements and the spatial resolution requirements for a number of different applications. And you can see that they vary depending on um, the type of application that you're looking at. So for climate um, forecasting and weather forecasting, you know, maybe uh, you know, once a week um, at you know, 50 or 100 kilometers is fine. But if we're trying to do precision agriculture, we're really right up in that top right-hand corner where we need the data at less than 100 metres resolution and we need it every day or a couple of days at most. So what do we currently have for measuring soil moisture? So it wasn't until 2009 we had our first dedicated soil moisture satellite, which is called SMOS, the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity Satellite. So that satellite um, provides a resolution of about 40 kilometers, which obviously doesn't meet that requirement for, for agriculture. But let's talk list a little bit about how SMOS works for those who might not be familiar with it. So SMOS has a Y-shaped uh, uh, antenna that you can see um, located here on the spacecraft. 
of about 69 independent uh, receivers that are located on that and using Symphifer Aphesis, uh, um, Aperture Synthesis, then it's able to produce an, an image uh, with a swath on the order of about you know, 1,000 or so kilometers. Um, but uniquely, uh, it also has a range of incidence angles from, from zero through out to about 60, 70 uh, degrees. So as the SMOS satellite moves along, it's effectively taking snapshots like you might with a digital camera, although it's not that sort of technology, but as a uh, to, to illustrate how it works. And so as it moves along, it takes these images and then you're able to get effectively for every point on the ground, a number of different incidence angles um, for, for those locations. And that potentially allows you to retrieve more information about what you're trying to observe than if you just got a, 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 a single incidence angle. In 2015, the SMAP mission was launched by NASA, the Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. Its objective was to increase the spatial resolution from 40 kilometers to around 10 kilometers by merging the radiometer footprint, the 40 kilometer radiometer footprint with a three kilometer radar observation. Um, unfortunately, that radar failed shortly after launch. Uh, and so the, the mission was not fully realized in a way it was envisaged, um, but did collect some radar data. Uh, and we will take a look at, at that in, in, the, in the slides that come. But also it's, it's, it's sought to introduce or to utilize radar data from other missions to be able to uh, replace that capability. Now the SMAP mission works a bit differently uh, to SMOS in the sense that it's got a large uh, dish antenna. It's about six meters in, in diameter. Um, and you know the resolution of this data is directly proportional to the uh, and or in, inversely proportional to the antenna size. So if you want to get high resolution, you've got to make a bigger antenna. And so six meters is already a pretty big uh, antenna. And so simply increasing the size of the antenna is probably not going to get you to where you need to be uh, for this sort of application. Um, but it also um, rotates. So it's this antenna spins around on its axis. And you can see it maps out these little red circles, which are footprints on the ground. And by doing that, it's able to map a swath um, at a single incidence angle um, as, as it moves forward. Okay, so if we come back to our soil moisture requirements and we put our capabilities on top of here, we can see you know, SMOS and SMAP are kind of you know in this part. You might get down to one kilometer at most, perhaps. You know, if you're able to fully utilize the one kilometer resolution of the radar that had been on board SMAP. Um, but, you know, that still doesn't get us down into the sort of the, the tens or hundreds uh, of meters that we really need for irrigation purposes. Um, there are radar missions, um, which have not been divided, um, developed specifically for soil moisture applications, although can be used for that, particularly at L band. Um, and so here are uh, some of the uh, uh, L-band missions um, that are available, the SALCOM uh, gives us data for part of the world about every uh, seven or so days using two spacecraft. Um, uh, LSR, which can give much higher resolution, but it's typically around once a, once a month that you can get data. Um, next, uh, next year, NISAR is scheduled to launch, which will give around 200 meter resolution data um, at, uh, I believe, a 14-day, uh, sorry, 12-day uh, repeat cycle. So those alone, probably not going to meet um, that requirement either, at least in terms of the temporal uh, requirement. Uh, there are also some other non-ideal um, data that can be used for soil moisture at C-band and X-band uh, and so on. Um, and finally, we have optical data, which can give very high resolution data and now can give it quite regularly in time, but there are challenges in using optical data as I'll talk about in a moment. So I wanna frame the rest of my talk now around four different questions. Um, and let me just briefly introduce those questions and then we'll come back to them and go through them in some more detail. So firstly, you know, we said we've got some different technologies that can be used for mapping soil moisture. L-band radiometry, which is probably the preferred, it's fairly accurate. 
Uh, it can give fairly high temporal repeats every two, three days, um, but the, it suffers from being a low spatial resolution. We have L-band radar data, which has very high spatial resolution. The accuracy is not so good. It's more difficult to interpret because of the nature of the signals are more affected by the vegetation and the surface roughness. Um, and also any one single radar itself typically has a fairly low um, temporal repeat cycle. Optical data, as I said, has a high spatial resolution, has a high temporal resolution if you can avoid the clouds. Um, which can be a challenge, particularly uh, in tropical areas. Um, and the ability to retrieve soil moisture from it is somewhat challenging, given that all you can directly observe is effectively the color of the vegetation or the color of the soil or the temperature of the leaves or the temperature of the skin of the soil, which has some relationship to soil moisture, but maybe not entirely at the instant um, that those measurements are being made um, or um, or, or for deeper into the soil itself. And so individually, there are challenges to be able to, to get the accuracy and the spatial temporal requirements um, that, that are needed. And so the idea that has been postulated for some time is around downscaling. And we talked about that with the SMAP mission, trying to use radar data to downscale um, the radiometer data. And so the first question that we're going to look at is how well can the current soil moisture downscaling algorithms perform? And is that a potential way forward? The next question is around using radar data directly. So as I said, radar can give us information about soil moisture at quite high resolution, but it's challenged by the, the temporal repeat. Now we seem to be getting new radar missions announced all the time. And I just mentioned NISAR is coming soon. And so the idea that we had a few years ago was why can't we combine all these radar missions together and be able to solve the temporal repeat time now obviously that has some other challenges um, uh, uh, around different configurations and different frequencies and and so on um, which potentially has some some benefits as well we've um, you know we've got even biomass with p-band which can potentially see deeper into the soil less affected by vegetation uh, and roughness uh, than some of the other frequencies and so the, the question that we're going to pose here is how well can we map soil moisture from multi-mission SAR data? The next um, question is going to be around uh, potentially using low altitude sensing. So just as an example, uh, on the right here, we've got data that was uh, collected at one kilometer resolution. Um, and then as we move to the left, you can see, and that's why I'm flying at uh, 3,000 meters from an aircraft. You know, if we halve the flying height, we can effectively halve the resolution and, and quarter and so on. And you can see that, you know, simply by flying lower, obviously we get much more detail in that data. And, you know, this is kind of where we need to try to get uh, down to. And you can see, obviously, the, the much more rich data that's available when you can get down to those sorts of uh, resolutions. So the, the question here is, you know, what are the options to improve the resolution capability simply by being closer to the object that you're trying to observe? Then the fourth question is more around a, a different challenge, and that's not about the spatial resolution, but that's the fact that agriculture really wants information about what's happening in the root zone of the soil, not just the top few centimetres or five centimetres that you might be able to get from L-band. And so the, the idea is that the longer the wavelength, then the deeper the layer of soil you can observe um, and also potentially um, do that more accurately by being less affected by surface roughness and less affected by the vegetation layer that's over, overlaying that soil surface as well. And, and so what we're going to look at here is, um, you know, can we improve the soil moisture mapping utility uh, by seeing it deeper into this, getting information deeper in the soil uh, by using longer wavelength data, such as from P-band. Now, in order to answer these questions, obviously we need some equipment and we need some data. Um, and so over the last uh, 15 or so years, we've developed uh, a, a collection of uh, equipment and, and experimental data sets that are gonna be utilized or some will be utilized in the data in the in the, uh, the the rest of this presentation. And so we have some visible cameras um, 
We have a, a range of different microwave instruments from K band. Uh, a lot of them are at L band. Uh, we also have a, a P band instrument at around 750 megahertz. Uh, we have some, some radars. This is also at L band and a P band. This is P band radar is at two different frequencies at uh, 440 and uh, 860 uh, megahertz. And then we've got some different platforms that we can use these instruments on, depending on which ones, um, ranging from aircraft through to drone and to some you know, ground-based um, platforms. So the, the L-band instrument we call Plimmer, uh, that allowed us to simulate data from SMOS, SMOS-type data, which is radiometer data alone, uh, and was used to uh, do a lot of work in evaluating the SMOS mission before and after launch. Um, combining that with the L-band radar has allowed us to do a number of uh, experiments looking at this, um, evaluating the SMAP mission, again, before and after launch. Now, with the, the P-band um, radiometer and radar data, um, that might potentially be one idea of a next-generation um, soil moisture mission. And um, just for completeness, I list here the, the range of different experimental data sets that are available for anyone who might be interested to use that data. Um, please feel free to contact us and we can point you in the right direction. Okay, so let's now look at these, these questions and we come back to the first one, which is how well do the current soil moisture downscaling algorithms perform? So this is some work that was done by one of my PhD students, Sabah Sabagi a couple of years ago, and you can see some publications in remote sensing or environment. If you want the, the details, I'm just going to give a very high level summary of some of that work. And so, as we've indicated, there's a potential to do downscaling using a number of different uh, approaches, and I list three of them here, um, being the radar-based approach, which is what the SMAP mission was planning to use. Um, there are radiometer-based approaches where you use a higher resolution radiometer um, and, and, the, and the spatial patterns that exist in that to try to downscale the, the um, lower resolution radiometer from at, uh, at a longer wavelength. Uh, and then you've got your optical based uh, methods as well. And of course there's pros and cons for each one. And I'm not gonna take the time to read through all of those, um, but uh, they, they, they each have their, 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 their advantages and disadvantages. And so what we did was we, um, using uh, data that we collected from one of our uh, campaigns just after SMAP launch, so when the SMAP radar was still working, um, we, we produced from, we got some aircraft data um, that we collected, and from that we were able to produce soil moisture maps at one kilometre spatial resolution over an area of about a... Um, 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. And we also had ground-based uh, measurements as well. So that gave us a, a data set that we could use as an evaluation data set to evaluate the downscaling or SMOS or SMAP um, radiometer data. And so we put a call out to the community to get all the different data products that were available at the time from those who are willing to participate to compare them uh, not only against each other, but uh, get, uh, compare them against a common uh, reference data set at a, at a common time. Because typically you look in the literature and you see a publication of this method somewhere based just on itself and a different method somewhere at a different time somewhere else. And you can't really um, see how well one is performing relative uh, to another. And so we, we got all those different uh, products. Um, We've also got an additional one here, which is we've called the oversampling based method. And that is because SMAP oversamples as it measures. And so it can potentially put that data onto a higher grid, even though it's not actually you know, on a 10 kilometer grid, but you can put it onto a 10 kilometer grid because it takes data effectively every 10 kilometers as it, as it um, um, circles. And so then we can compare with our ground validation data set. So this is the data um, that we had. It's pretty busy. Let me just explain what we've got here. So in this column to the left is our aircraft soil moisture estimates at one kilometre resolution uh, across a number of uh, days of the campaign that we undertook. Then as we go across um, the top here, and unfortunately that thing keeps coming down and blocking part of my slide, 
but uh, we've got a range of different methods. So the ones with a D at the end are for descending overpasses and the ones with an A are for ascending overpasses. Um, and apart from that, we've got the first two are radar-based approaches. This is the default SMAP active passive approach. This is an approach that's been uh, developed out of University of Southern uh, California. Um, on the right here, in the highest spatial resolution, obviously because of the optical data being available at high resolution, we have a number of optical based approaches, um, the dispatch approach and the BEC approach. And then in the middle, we've got the radiometer approaches. So the SMAP SFIM used K band data to try to downscale the L band radiometer. And then there's the two enhanced products, which are effectively the oversampling uh, methodology. Um, so you can look at those and you can try to draw some sense of which ones might be agreeing best with what we're seeing um, from our observations on the on the left. And I'll leave that uh, to you at this stage. Um, but as I said, we've got this was collected at one kilometer resolution, so we can directly compare against this one kilometer data. But the rest of this is at nine kilometers. So we've also averaged those up to the same nine kilometer resolution. So we can put them on the same um, spatial scale. Now, we've evaluated this in two ways. First of all, we've looked at each of those pixels through time and looked at the temporal correlation, which is the way most of these products get evaluated. Somebody's got a a study somewhere and they've got one or two stations and they look at those stations against that pixel and they look at the temporal correlation and say it looks good or not. Um, so we've looked at the data in that way, um, but then we've also looked at it spatially. And I'll do that on the next slide. So at the top row here is for the data that was at one kilometer resolution. And the bottom row is for the data at nine kilometer resolution. Now, We've got R squared on the horizontal axis for all of them. And then the vertical axis on the left is the root mean square difference. In the middle is the unbiased root mean square difference, which is a, a metric commonly used in the soil moisture field. And then to the right is, is the bias. Um, for the moment, I think we can conclude that at one kilometer resolution, the R squareds are all very poor. And so we can kind of say they're not working particularly well. Um, for the nine kilometer data, we've got some better R squareds, 0 0.6, uh, 0.7. In particular, this is the SMAP active passive. Um, now this is the MOEO uh, uh, approach, and this is the active passive approach. Both of them are active passive um, methods, um, but just different algorithms and how they're applied. Uh, and then we've got uh, the, and I should say that these are the legends here actually apply to all the all three of these. It's not that this is for this one and this is for that one. It's just they didn't all fit on the one, the one slide. So um, what we can kind of conclude from there is the active passive approach uh, seems to work okay from a temporal uh, correlation um, perspective with okay-ish root mean square errors. I mean, some of them a bit high, 0 0.1, but uh, 0 0.06 uh, here. Um, but if we look at that, then in terms of the spatial analysis, you get a very different story. And, you know, no matter which one you're looking at, they're all kind of clustered uh, down in this uh, to the right here with R squared values of, you know, less than 0 0.3, which to me is not particularly satisfying and suggests that there is more work to be done with the downscaling approaches if we're going to be able to use them with confidence. Okay, so let's come now to the second question, which is how well can we map soil moisture from multi-mission SAR data? And again, there is a number of papers there you can refer to. This was work done by another of my PhD students, uh, Lu Jun Zhu. And uh, the idea here is that um, we want to, as I said before, we want to incorporate different SAR missions because so we can beat down the, the temporal um, re resolution uh, requirement. Now, doing that, obviously, they've got different wavelengths, they've got different um, incidence angles and probably different polarizations and a whole range of different features. Um, but one of the things we also want to do is use the, combine this data 
uh, in a multi-temporal way, because that allows us uh, typically to, to get more accurate retrievals. Um, so by, by being able to make assumptions that some of the parameters are not varying, so the roughness for in particular, which has a strong impact um, on, on radar data, um, but also the vegetation water content. And we, we, we also, um, but you know, we also impose a, a dry down uh, constraint, which helps us to achieve an even better uh, um, retrieval as well. So we can assume that it's each day is going to be drier than the last, um, and vegetation hasn't changed and roughness hasn't changed, then that that reduces some of the um, complexity in being able to do the uh, the soil moisture retrievals. Now, one of the issues with that is that you know from day to day things do change. So Potentially, as you can see here, the roughness has changed. Somebody's plowed their field um, or somebody's harvested part of their crop. Um, and so there are impacts in the, in the, in the veg, or perhaps they're irrigated. And, and so there is a, a need to do some pre-processing to be able to determine where are the chunks in time that you can break your data up into where you do have uh, effectively um, uh, consistent uh, set of um, conditions. And so just to kind of briefly summarize how, how this method was applied, you know, the first step was to develop these data cubes. So doing all the complex radar modeling offline, doing that once, this is nothing new. It's, it's done by SMAP and, and other products already. Um, and so you, you've got here for your different polarizations, BV, HV, HH, et cetera, relationships between roughness, vegetation, water content, and your dielectric properties or your soil moisture uh, content. And so in this uh, example here, we used uh, L-band data from the aircraft combined with some radar sat C-band data and some Cosmo SkyMed X-band data. So the second step was to determine where and when you could actually use the C and X-band data and, and actually add value. So if your vegetation is too dense, then your, your C or your X-band data can't actually free, see through to the soil. And therefore, it's not actually, it's just adding noise um, rather than actually adding um, information. And so first step, the, the, the second step here then is to determine the relative soil contribution of the input data and where which data could be used. Then the third step was, as I indicated on the previous slide, of being able to identify where there may have been a surface change due to harvesting or plowing or, or irrigation or, or something else. Um, and so then you can break your, your data up into different time series. So here we've got some data where there's been no changes. You can use all the data as a single time series, but in some other cases, there may have been something that changed. And so you've got to break that into two sub series for that, for that period. So over on the right here, then we have some soil moisture retrievals using this approach. And you can see that, you know, for most of the time, it's all changing consistently. And then you get to a period here, there's a couple of fields that have changed differently to the others. Um, some irrigations that have occurred in these ones and potentially some harvesting in these other ones. Um, and so this is the, the soil moisture that we could then retrieve using that approach. And we're able to achieve uh, an RMSE of about 0 0.07 um, for a, a pixel size of 25 meters. Now, if we make that a bit coarser and we average the data up into a, to a, the field size or the paddock scale, then we're able to reduce that room and square error down to about 0 0.05. Now, just um, comparing this with a couple of different approaches. So on the left is using the more traditional single snapshot approach. The middle one is the time series approach that's being uh, used by a few people at the moment. And then on the right is using the time series approach, but with a dry down constraint. And you can see as you move from the left to the right, there's an improvement uh, in, in the accuracy uh, of those results. So concluding from that work, I think there, there is a potential to get field or subfield scale soil moisture from radar, but it will require combining different radar missions, and it will probably require having this dry down constraint rather than just a, a single time series constraint. 
that means it's going to have some level of complexity. And so you're going to have to convince data centers like the DAC who do some of this analysis to be able to, first of all, be able to bring in different radar data from different missions. And some of those have some costs associated with them, but then also be able to carry enough time series of data in their processing um, to be able to, uh, and do the, the pre-processing to break it up into various time series. So it's a, it's a complicated method. Um, and I'm told at the moment for the NISAR mission, they're probably only gonna do a time series with three uh, images in, in sequence. So um, th that's just some of the challenges there are perhaps in, in a radar-based approach. So then the third question was, you know, what are the options to improve resolution by being closer to the ground? Obviously, being able to just use a radiometer directly, it's fairly it's a fairly simple uh, approach um, to get soil moisture. Um, and if you don't have to worry about downscaling or all these other things, then it, it makes it makes it easy. But the application is perhaps more limited in where you can do it. And we'll talk about some different scales of how that might be done. So the first is, you know, what if we put a radiometer directly onto the irrigation boom where they're applying the, the irrigation? Um, and so we've, we used the equipment that we had available for doing this. Obviously, it could be miniaturized a lot more than what we've got here. Um, and, and, but this is just a, a sort of a proof of concept. So we've got the uh, Elbara um, instrument with a fairly small horn that you can see here. Um, there's some batteries and some RF components, which we put inside a container just to make sure it was waterproof and wasn't going to get wet from the irrigation. Um, and then we positioned that in a single location on this boom, co-located with one irrigation spray. Now, you could apply this in a couple of different ways. You, you could have a whole range of these are, are mounted along your irrigation boom. Um, alternatively, you could have a rail that goes along the top of that boom and a little pulley system that runs a radiometer backwards and forwards, scans it like a uh, a, a swift broom uh, sensor so that as a, the irrigator is moving along, uh, it keeps scanning backwards and forwards across uh, your, your field. But as I said, for this application, we've just got in one single fixed location. So we, the field was about, uh, well, it was 200 meters across, but at the data we were able to get was about a five meter spatial resolution from the height that we had the radiometer installed uh, and across a 600 meter long field. And we did this on a couple of dates. I'm just showing you an example of data from one date. And the, this is the brightness temperature data we measured and the, the blue dots here are our estimates of soil moisture from the Elbara brightness temperatures. The red dots are what we measured uh, on the ground from a, a hand probe. And so you can see that generally there's a, there's a reasonable agreement um, between those, those two. And obviously there's variation along the field as well, which if the farmer knew that information or the irrigator knew that information could adjust how much it's irrigating as it moved along rather than just applying the same amount from one end of the field to the other. There are other ways that this could be done. Um, buggies, perhaps, farm equipment. Um, in horticulture, it could be on a little autonomous buggy that just roams around your vegetable patch, um, measuring the, the, the soil moisture and feeding that information in, basically unsupervised. Um, more recently, we also put this onto the back of a, a ute. Um, this is not, this wasn't for agriculture. This was for a different application. This was for road construction. Um, the soil moisture when you're building the road is important for getting the optimum compaction um, of your road material. So just as another example of, of how this sort of uh, technology could be used. Um, and, and here's an example of some from data from one of those buggies uh, out in the, in the field. The third approach um, is perhaps putting this onto a UAV. Now, the idea here in the long term for this, I think for this to be uh, adopted by the agricultural community is it almost has to be autonomous. You know, and obviously there are some regulations at the moment that prevent that. These have to be piloted, line of sight, so on. But at some point, I think uh, the administration is gonna have to catch up with technology 
Um, and the same way as we've got uh, two ton tractors now driving around the field unsupervised, I'm sure we can have a 20 or 30 kilogram drone flying around a field also uh, unsupervised. Um, but uh, this is a, 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 a the, the, the drone that uh, we're, we're currently working on. There are a number of other um, drone-based applications that are available too if you look on the internet. Um, so this is just a couple of weeks ago when I was up in Amherst um, um, having a, a review of, of our instrument, which is about ready to be sent to us. Now, at the moment, we don't actually have the drone, so I don't have any data from it to show. But what we do have is a bunch of aircraft data, which we've been able to collect at similar sorts of resolutions to be able to demonstrate um, the, the sort of data that we can get from that. And so again, this is using our L-band radiometer. Um, this is a irrigation circle here. Um, and, and we had a bunch of flight lines where we collected a 75 meter resolution data in this case. And those red dots are where we measured the soil moisture on the ground for verifying or evaluating our data. And so what we can see here on the, on the, on the left is our retrieved soil moisture estimates um, from the aircraft. In the, the next column is what we um, measured on the ground. And then this is the rest of the data that we got from the uh, aircraft instruments across three subsequent days. And the black line here is the location of the irrigation boom. And so the irrigator was operating the entire time, moving in a clockwise direction. And so they don't line up exactly the timing of when the ground measurements were made and when the aircraft went over. Um, but what you can see is as we go through time, we can see that the the wetter areas are obviously behind the uh, irrigation boom uh, and generally uh, matching up with the patterns that we can see in the in the ground data. Um, another example over a larger area um, and over a longer period of time, this was over a month um, in uh, the month of uh, November, from the 1st of November through the 24th of November, we started with relatively wet conditions and dried down and then there was some rainfall towards the end um, and i'm focusing in on this focus farm here which was this one in the middle here part of a, a larger area that we were we were flying so comparing that with ground measurements um, first of all we ha we have a, a single monitoring station located here which you can see in the solid line so this is probably typical of what a lot of farmers would do at the moment. They put one station in, they say, I'll use that to represent what's happening on my farm or whatever. Um, but this is a good example that, yeah, it kind of picks up the time series maybe, but it's not picking up the, the absolute value. There's obviously a, an offset there between what we measured on the ground with the, um, with the triangles um, and the whiskers here represent plus or minus uh, the standard deviation to represent the variation that was across the farm. Um, are not, well, perhaps with one uh, exception, are, are not overlapping with what we're getting from, from that one station. But importantly, what we were able to get from the aircraft, with the exception of the day that it was raining and thus water on the vegetation, which would have impacted on our retrievals, um, there is a good agreement between what we measured on the ground and what we got from the aircraft. So, Coming to my last um, potential way of doing this by being closer to the ground and moving up one step, you know, rather than doing it with a drone on an individual farmer by farmer basis, what if we have one of these HAPS high altitude platforms which can operate for weeks or months on end um, and, and collect data um, continuously? Now, so let's put this into the altitude perspective. So we've got our spacecraft here. They fly at around 600 to 800 kilometers. Uh, we've got our UAV, which we talked about before. They're limited to less than 120 meters above the ground. Uh, aircraft probably somewhere in the range from 150 meters to three kilometers. Um, we've got our aircraft, our airliners fly around about 15 kilometers in altitude. These HAPs are about 20 kilometers, so they're just above the, the airliners. They're above all the weather, um, so they can get the sunlight to recharge the batteries during the day to be able to continue to operate uh, during the night. 
and from some back of the envelope calculations, um, potentially could get data in the order between 100 meters uh, to a kilometer, depending on how big uh, you make the uh, antenna array that might mount on the bottom of that hat. So that's an idea we're thinking about at the moment, um, being able to cover larger areas um, to, to still achieve a higher spatial resolution. Okay, and so now coming to my final question, uh, which is, can we improve soil moisture mapping utility from longer wavelength data? So this is some work that's been done by a number of my students, um, uh, Xiaoji Shan and Fawad Brakasi and uh, Nifi um, Bupafi and, and, uh, and others. And there's a, there's a, a swag of, of students who have been working on this and there are many more publications that are coming. These are the ones that are kind of available now. But just a very brief introduction to, to some of this work. Um, so as I said, this is using P-band. And um, so what we had was uh, for the work that I'm gonna show here, we've got some flight data as well, but from the, is from a tower uh, that we had installed on a, on a focus farm that we broke up into four different quadrants where we could treat each of these differently in terms of their surface roughness and the type of vegetation that was um, planted there from grass through wheat and corn and able to uh, compare L-band and P-band both separately or, or, or together. And so this is our, our tower installation. So this uh, tower could put itself down when it's too windy. Um, it can uh, rotate. So we've got L-band on one side, P-band on the other. They've got opposing uh, angles so that we can change the angles um, and we can also rotate it around to look L-band one side for a bit p-band the other and then switch sides and then go to the other quadrants in order to to collect data so one of the the questions that we first looked at was you know what's the retrieval depth we should be able to get from using uh, p-band at the 750 uh, megahertz that our instrument is um and we, we looked at a couple of, uh, or a number of sort of typical soil moisture profiles and we label them one through six, where number six is uh, a soil moisture profile that we were observing uh, in the field. Um, and then um, Xiaoji came up with a numerical model to try to estimate the depth that we might be able to retrieve the soil moisture. Um, and, and um, we can see that that varies, uh, that retrieval depth varies as a function of frequency uh, and, and, this, and also for the different profiles, uh, shapes. Um, and this is for L-band and this is for P-band. And um, in this particular case uh, for profile number six, uh, we're able to increase the sensing depth from about five centimeters to seven centimeters for the 750 megahertz. Now P-band can go you know, much longer than that, obviously the 400, 300 megahertz. And you know, clearly once you, you start to get down to here, you, you start to see for some of these profiles, much larger increases uh, in that sensing depth. Uh, we also looked at this same question using our field data and we correlated the, uh, the soil moisture thickness. We're measuring soil moisture at different five centimeter increments down the profile. Um, uh, with MPDI, which is a ratio of the V and H polarizations. And what we're able to find is that for P-band, um, if we assumed it was for the same soil moisture sampling depth, five centimeters, then we get an increase in the correlation or a, an improvement in the retrieval accuracy of the soil moisture. Um, or alternatively, you could interpret that as being for the same level of accuracy, you can get an increase um, in the sensing depth on the order of what our model was, was telling. The next question that we've looked at is the effect of roughness. And you know, is our L-band data less affected by roughness than P-band, which is what we expect from the theory. And um, so we, we looked at these uh, under bare soil conditions, uh, a, a rough but flat surface, uh, a, a relatively smoother but flat surface. And then we've got you know these periodically rough surfaces um, in different orientations, either parallel or, or perpendicular to the, the look uh, direction. Importantly, what we showed here was that um, pretty much for all cases, except for the smooth flat case, we got an improvement in our uh, root mean square error for P-band relative to L-band, which is what we expected. Um, so that's encouraging. 
The next thing that we looked at was the impact of the vegetation. So as we said, you know, we expect the vegetation to also be more transparent. This is an example for the wheat um, field under the the um, the smooth um, smooth bear uh, smooth sorry not bear but the the the, the, the smooth um, rough field, and so um, the the blue circles or the dots here rather is the P band retrievals of soil moisture. <laughs> And the orange is the old band. And again, we can see some improvement in our um, soil moisture retrievals at P band over what we got at L band. Then finally, we looked at, you know, rather than just, you know, taking these as single data that might give us a, a, a single observation that give us a, 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 a soil moisture that might be for a slightly deeper layer. Can we somehow rather use this data to estimate the soil profile rather than data assimilation, which we're also looking at with another student, Richard? Um, but you know, assuming that the soil profiles can be approximated by a mathematical function of a particular shape. And so then uh, rather than trying to estimate the soil moisture at every depth, we estimate some parameters that describe that mathematical function, whether that's a linear, whether that's a linear function. Um, so we looked at a number of things, you know, uh, linear, exponential, second order polynomial, um, third order polynomial, piecewise uh, linear, um, and a couple of approximations to Richard's equations as well. Um, and we also looked at, you know, if we just use L-band data or we just use P-band data or we use the two together, or we use the L band to do part of the retrieval, and then we use the P band to do the second part of the retrieval. And what we found from this um, synthetic study and was also confirmed with using our real tower data was that um, using the L band and P band data together gave us the best results. Um, and that using either a linear or a second order polynomial equation um, gave us the best uh, best results. And so under some conditions, we could estimate that soil profile down to 30 centimeters um, using an approach like that. In others, it was more limited to maybe the top 10 centimeters. And then finally, what we've started looking at, and I don't have any results to present at this stage, but as I said earlier, is what if we combine active passive L band with active passive P band, which is basically a SMAP mission on steroids, if you like. And so we've just conducted a couple of field experiments where we've collected data that will allow us to simulate that combination. Um, and so um, one of the challenges you've got with P band data is that for the same uh, antenna size, you're gonna get about half the resolution. So one of the challenges is how do we use a lower resolution P band with a, L, a radiometer with a, uh, a higher resolution L-band radiometer data. And so we were able to simulate a, a single 36 kilometer P-band, 18 kilometer L-band pixels, and then our L and P-band radar data um, at about hundred meters or less. And so I've got three students who are looking at how we might use this data to get not only higher resolution, but also profile soil moisture information from this combination. So I think I'm about out of time. So I come to my conclusions. Uh, and, you know, first of all, you know, as I said earlier, you know, I think our downscaling methods at the moment don't yet quite meet the requirements of many of our applications. And so there's plenty more work for our researchers to do to uh, enhance and improve those. Uh, I believe the radar technology does have the potential to meet the requirements. But again, there's more work to be done around the how um, that data is processed and in particular, getting our processing centers uh, on board with uh, being able to uh, utilize these um, more complicated approaches and be able to bring in data from different SAR missions, potentially from different countries. Um, I believe putting passive microwave technology on platforms closer to the earth is the, probably the most straightforward and immediate um, solution that we've got for getting uh, less than 100 meter resolution soil moisture uh, with a reliable uh, accuracy. But that Either well, at the moment that requires direct input by the land managers to implement those sorts of technologies. Um, P band also, I think, does show some promise for complementing uh, L band. 
but that's not without its challenges, both in terms of the course of spatial resolution, um, but also the radio frequency interference that can be uh, quite um, uh, extensive in some parts of the world. And so I will leave it at that and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Walker. So uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, and uh, is there any good questions? Oh, thank you. Yeah, Jeff, first, I greatly appreciate uh, your willingness to give us uh, this seminar. As a, as a small group at uh, NOAA, we, uh, for doing so, so much, we, we, our mandate is a little bit different. We want the top science and the top technology, but we want the top operate, operational ability is we have to generate operational product for our uh, numerical weather prediction and also wa water prediction. It's similar to agriculture application requiring high resolution, high temporal uh, observations. But we are, as we work together too, yeah, we are trying uh, different approaches. For, for, the, for the first conclusion here, we you probably doing that too, yeah, using machine learning approach. It's a, what's your insight toward the machine learning approach application for operational soil moisture mapping? This is the first question. The second question is we want a deep layer soil moisture too. Yeah? And uh, according to your conclusion here, looks like uh, the, as the sensible depth is not as uh, what we expected. Because uh, when I read the advertisement uh, from NASA mission, um, proposals, they talk about a one meter depth. Looks like you're talking about a seven centimeter as far away from one meter. What's your uh, e expression for future technology development for deeper layers so much? Maybe. Okay, so two questions. The first one is about using machine learning for downscaling. Well, I think there's some potential for that. And I've got a collaborator at the moment who's also looking at trying to do this with some of the data that we've got. I think the challenge, though, is how you train a machine learning model with limited data to be able to work globally. Um, and so I think that is going to be the challenge uh, to overcome to, to get that to, to really be realized. Um, in terms of the the depth for p-band um i think there's a couple of things to note first of all we've used radiometer um and it was 750 megahertz um the 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 studies that you refer to have used radar at 400 megahertz thereabouts i think um so different frequencies different technologies potentially um respond differently to the depth in the soil um, you know, we're, we've also now got some data for higher frequency, uh, sorry, lower frequencies um, from radar, but we haven't yet had the opportunity to analyze that. So I can't um, confirm or otherwise uh, the results that you referred to. But I think also the conditions, right? You know, if it's wet or dry conditions, you're going to get a different sort of response in terms of what you can retrieve as well. So under drier conditions, typically we see that you can, well, so so there's two things. I think also the the the, the work that you're referring to is, is similar to what I was presenting at the end where they're using a mathematical function to do that extrapolation to deeper in the profile. So they're not directly seeing to one metre, but they're able to infer to one metre. Now we we're able to infer to probably 30 centimetres. Um, but you know, with a long, a longer wavelength, maybe we could infer to a, a, a deeper layer too. Yeah. Excellent talk. And uh, I have a couple of technology related questions <laughs> since you covered pretty well. So the first question is about a GNSSR or reflectometry. Uh, I didn't see this mentioned here, but I did see some uh, references uh, and studies. So what's your view on the potential of that 
technology for soil moisture. That's the first question. The second question is about the P-band. That sounds pretty intriguing uh, because you can penetrate uh, deeper in the soil moisture. Uh, but what I worry about is the antenna size uh, because the L-band is already pretty large, you know, when you do a space-based, uh, you know, radiometer. But is the P-band requires even bigger antenna uh, to get to the same kind of resolution. That's all, thank you. Hey, I've forgotten your first question already. <laughs> the, the GNSS. Oh, yeah. like, um, uh, so look, I'm not a, an expert on the reflectometry missions, but as I understand, they suffer from the same spatial resolution challenges. Uh, as our radiometers because they're not a true radar so they can't do true SAR processing um, and also so so Cygnus is probably okay because you've got enough um, GPS uh, signals around that you can actually get a bit of a, a swath uh, of, of data but you're, you're limited to kind of where that satellite happens to be um, to where you get your bounced signal back so Snoopy for example that's launching soon um, my understanding of it is you've got basically one telecommunication satellite at P-band, and so you get one line of data on the ground um, at any time, unlike GPS, where you've got you know whole constellations of now, I think, over 100 plus um, satellites that you can get those L-band signals uh, from. But your challenge is still going to be the resolution. It's still a, a about a 30 kilometer resolution uh, observation. Now, I put on the second question, which was about antenna size. So I've seen some talks presented that we're looking at having replacement missions for SMOS or SMAP that would have a rota you know, a scanning antenna concept with up to, I think, an 18 meter antenna. So I believe that's technically feasible. Um, and so, you know, if you did have an 18 meter antenna, that would mean instead of a, a, you know, a 40 kilometer resolution, then that's probably a third of that, um, 12 kilometers or 10 kilometers or something. Um, so, and, and, if, and if you're using 750 megahertz P band, then, you know, that that's means uh, for that same size antenna, you're gonna have, you know, let's say one's 10 kilometers and the other would be 20 kilometers. Um, so, you know, it's it's not, you know, if you're making the antenna bigger, you're not degrading the resolution any more than you would be um, from what we've currently got uh, from L-band. And then as one of my students is doing, and I didn't get to talk about it in the last slide, is, you know, can we use the L-band data in a way to help enhance the spatial resolution of the P-band data while still keeping the P-band signal? Um, and so that may be a potential way of bringing the P-band data onto the same resolution as the L-band. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Tiger Yang, working on the micro uh, calibration. I'm very interested in those uh, different type of instrument, uh, the uh, radiometer developed, I guess, in your lab, you have lab. And uh, good to know that uh, when, well, now everybody focus on satellite, still you have some, you know, those ground-based or drone-based, airborne-based, that um, radiometer played a role in the remote sensing science. Actually, we have a small app here and we're developing a instrument. Currently we're developing 22 gigahertz um, radiometer. And I also like the way you put different way you put the instrument in a different facility and put on the irrigation that facility, put on the cart, moving more around. I really like those ideas. I hopefully in future we can, uh, you know, do the similar stuff. I have two questions and uh, uh, in case you forgot, i ask one more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the you. The first question is I thought that uh, for L-band, uh, sometimes when you do the um, ground experiment, sometimes you put the patch antenna I think at, 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 that is in the drone case. And the other case, you put a, um, a horn, standard horn antenna. Uh, is that big difference uh, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, antenna um, performance, antenna performance? 
the patch antenna and the horn antenna for the L band radiometer. Is big difference? Um, look, we've not personally noticed a big difference. Um, I guess the the people who provided us the L bar instrument were more in favor of horn technology, and that's what they wanted to provide their instrument to us with. Whereas the you know, the, the, a lot of the other equipment that we're flying on aircraft or drones, you, you know, our, our, our aircraft didn't really um, lend itself to flying big horns underneath. So we've had to uh, adopt a, a patch and antenna approach. And, you know, we've, we've found the patch uh, to work very well. Yeah, okay. So the second question is that uh, I guess those ground-based radiometer, you cannot do it, you know, um, very frequent calibration. You, it's, I guess it is the uh, um, not total power. It is the decay tap or some noise injection tap. Radiometer don't is quietly because you need very stable gain. Um, you can't be right. It is not total power. So we on the tower, we had that so it could actually turn it every night. It turned itself upside down and looked at the sky. For a couple of hours um and then once a week we would come out to the field and we'd bring the tower down and we, we do did a, a ground-based calibration um looking at a, a black box um I, i'm not a electrical engineer so I, and I don't build radiometers so i probably can't tell you a lot about the technicalities of uh, exactly how they work internally um but you know we we found that that was sufficient to keep our instruments fairly well calibrated. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's check out. Um, let's check the chat. Okay, so we do got a couple of online questions. Um, let me go through them all by one. So uh, yeah, I can just answer yeah. that. So the first one is about soil moisture under trees. We've not personally worked on retrieving soil moisture under forests. I can't really respond to that from my own personal experience. Um, but there is a big effort underway at the moment in the US. The last map vex experiment was conducted up in New York and Canada that was looking uh, into that question. I believe it's too early to answer that they're still um, analyzing their data, but you know, hopefully we'll know more um, from that uh, as we go forward. Second question is how are the downscaling methods beyond agriculture systems such as lowland forests and wetlands? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um, I think the same challenges apply. I mean, the area that we did our analysis for um, was either grassland, was of grassland or cropland. Um, but um, yeah, depends on what exactly they're wanting to to do. You wanting soil moisture in wetlands? I'm not sure. But anyway, sorry, I can't probably answer that question very well. The the next one is about. RFI. Um, so we didn't see a lot of RFI in our site. We did see some. Um, it was definitely something we had to be careful of, but we tried to also choose sites where we knew RFI was going to be relatively um, limited. I understand that's not the case in the US. And from some studies, um, some colleagues trying to repeat similar studies here, they've had a lot of challenges um, from uh, RFI at PBN, particularly in the DC area. Now, there may be other parts of the, the country which is less affected, um, but it certainly is one of the challenges. Um, one of the approaches that has been proposed to try to uh, minimise this is using broadband uh, technology where you can frequency jump around. Um, so if you detect it in one channel, you can jump to an adjacent channel that might be uh, it might be clean but it's one of the challenges for a global implementation. All right, so any other questions? And for the online audience, uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, 
um, and come up with um, as many questions. Um, but with Zen, I think we uh, like to thank the speaker for the great talk. And this is our last seminar uh, this uh, semester. So I'd like to thank everyone for um, const constantly showing up and supporting us. And we will update our um, seminar schedule on our um, Google Calendar and uh, ASIC News site. So um, stay tuned. <laughs>